The last class that we had here in Book of Acts, we began in chapter 15. As we are encountering the famous church council in Jerusalem to deal with the issue of the matter of circumcision. And I think just by quick review, uh, certain people were going down to Antioch um, saying that it was necessary for the Gentiles to be circumcised and uh, uh, to command them to keep the law of Moses. We're going to talk about what that did mean here as we go along. Uh, that did not mean that uh, you know, it has uh, not a problem in keeping the law of God. But we're going to find out and understand what it is that uh, was really the issue uh, as it comes up here uh, in, in this Council of Antioch. We got down to, I believe, in the last class, uh, to chapter 15 and chapter, uh, verse 8. And I made, uh, I think, a strong point as we closed up last time about the, the, uh, what I call the fellowship of the heart. Verse 8 says, God knows the heart and acknowledge them, meaning the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. And that um, is Peter speaking, and it references back to his visit to Cornelius, where the Gentiles were called there, Cornelius and his uh, cohort, and they spoke in tongues as they received the Holy Spirit. And then Peter reported that to, uh, to a group of the church in Jerusalem in the next chapter and what had happened and he's kind of repeating that. And, but here there's this emphasis, which I really love, uh, that God, God who knows the heart. And he, he granted them the, the, the Spirit, just as He had to the Jewish people. And in verse 9 it says, "...and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith." And, you know, if you understand the New Covenant, which we do, and we... Uh, we are under the new covenant uh, today. And in Jeremiah and in the book of Hebrews, the primary description of the new covenant is God writing His laws upon our heart. And the, the, the moral, spirit, the spiritual law, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Decalogue, the, the great Ten, that spiritual law that uh, is a part of you know, every relationship with God confirmed by any covenant and is eternal, it's spirit. It, it can't be done away with. It can't be obliterated. It can't be removed from the presence of our relationship with God because He's writing that upon our hearts in this new covenant. And Peter really strikes to that. Um, there, all of us have our hearts purified by faith. And we join, if you will, a fellowship of the heart when we are joined to Christ through baptism and the receipt of the Spirit, and He lives His life within us, and we are, are, are reconciled to the Father through the sacrifice of, of Christ. It's a fellowship of the heart, or it's not a fellowship at all. And I understand that, and what that means, and that means so, so much in terms of our relationships. Um, and in this case here with the Gentiles and the, the Jewish a component of the church and the blending together of these peoples, that's what's so critical. Uh, then and now, all peoples being brought into a relationship with God, into a covenant with God, and striking through all of the clutter of what was even in the first century had been built up over generations and centuries within Judaism uh, that was keeping people from the, the pure worship of God through heart of faith, a purified heart, and yet retaining the very essence of the relationship with God, which is based upon His, His eternal law. How do we love God? The first four commandments. How do we love our fellow man? The, uh, the last six commandments, and the definitions that those ten give. This is what was cut through in this council, and unfortunately it's not always understood by uh, Christianity today and by really intelligent scholars who know the Bible and the Greek and everything else, but they have, a, they have blinders on, and they're not able to see this. So let's look at what, what, uh, what is happening here as we move to verse 10 and, in this council. And keep in mind, this is a con convening of ministers in Jerusalem and elders, uh, some named, Peter's named. We know that uh, Paul and, and uh, uh, Titus and 
uh, Silas and Barnabas are, are there, and uh, no doubt others, uh, but those are the ones named. Now in verse 10, Peter continues with his particular part of his speech. He says, now therefore, why do you test God? And he's speaking to the assembly of elders and, and to the community of the, 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 uh, the Jews that are prominent here in Jerusalem by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. That's the critical key to understanding what is going now to happen. He says, you, why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck? Now, we have to define a yoke. I could have put a picture on uh, through the slide here of a team of oxen pulling, um, uh, yoked and pulling a plow. Have any of you ever seen that actually being done? We don't, have you? Uh, you? You go to Africa, you'll see that quite often. I was woke up one morning in a place where we were staying in Africa, looked out the back window, and here out the field uh, were a couple of farmers plowing their field with a yoke of oxen by hand. And they didn't have a John Deere tractor. Uh, they didn't have some big, big implement. They were going back and forth across this field with a, with a bull who was, being, who was uh, uh, yoked to their plow, and they were plowing it. Typically, you might see two animals yoked together. And we kind of introduced this when we were talking about Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Why do you kick against the pricks, Christ asked him. And um, uh, the same idea, because they would put a, a kind of a, a, a large post type that was pointed there at the back of the, in front of the, the cart uh, to keep the, the oxen from pulling forward, to, to pull forward so they wouldn't halt and try to go backwards. If they did, they got something stuck up, you know, the backside. And that, you know, kept them, kept them going forward. Here it's being used in the idea of putting a yoke, which is a burden, uh, and a wooden yoke, an iron yoke is a burden put upon typically animals to engage their power to do work. And it, it is used here in the sense of a, um, of a burden that, in this case, people are not able to bear. So what is this yoke? This is going to be the critical thing that we want to, to understand out of this discussion here. Uh, what is this that Peter is referring to? So keep that in mind as we progress um, uh, in this. He says, verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they, the Gentiles, altogether being saved by grace not by any works. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 2. We are saved by grace, not by works. We are created unto good works, he also says in Ephesians 2 as well. Um, and, and But it, it is not uh, works uh, of any law that we might do that saves us. It is the grace of God by which salvation is granted here. Uh, we believe that, and so Peter then is beginning to, to trace what is, what is happening here. So, before we go forward, because this kind of ends the, the point, and Peter sets down. And if you look at verse 12, first uh, clause there, then all the multitude kept silent. Now, the, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all the ships at sea, when you have a room full of ministers, and they all keep silent, you have achieved a miracle. <laughs> Set in on a council of elders meetings, uh, and you will understand what that means. Um, ministers like to be heard. Ministers like to preach, right? Ministers are authority figures, and so uh, we, we get in a room together. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an idea, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but, it, but uh, it's, it's humorous here. All the multitude kept silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And then verse 13 says, after they became silent, so another period of silence, um, James answered them. But before we get to James's answer, let's go back. Let me give you a little background and let's understand with some other scriptures what it is that we're, we are addressing here with circumcision and the law 
and the issues that, uh, that are being put forth here in, the, in this council that Peter says you're in danger, you're, you're testing God by putting a yoke on the neck of these Gentile disciples, which, which he says, again, going back to verse 10, neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. So the fathers goes back to the story of Israel, the Israelites, the tribes, their ancestors. These, this room full of largely Jewish men, Benjamin mixed in and perhaps some other elements of some of the other tribes, but that's uh, primarily Judah, uh, Judah and uh, Benjamin there. But he's going back to the beginnings into the law of the five books and the, the origins of Israel as a covenant nation under God, and then what happened there. Now, you've studied this as, you, as you're going through the Pentateuch. You're, you've, um, have you gone through all of Galatians yet? You're still, still working your way through Galatians. So you're, you're right in the midst of this, and this fits into what, um, uh, what you're learning there as you go through the, the, the Galatians. And Peter says, they weren't able to bear it. We were not able to bear it. Um, if you look, what, what, let's understand what this is. If you look into the, the, the Gospels and the story of Christ and His interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees during His ministry, um, we understand that Christ and these prominent Jewish leaders of, the, of that period disagreed over the very matter of the, the status of a developing oral law. All right? An oral law. Now, this is different from the Ten Commandments that was given at Mount Sinai. And even largely the, the, uh, the, the statutes and judgments that flow from that, that you read about in Exodus and Leviticus, many of which were civil statutes, dealing with the interactions between people. Um, if you were responsible for killing accidentally somebody's uh, goat, donkey, cow, how was restitution made? There were laws about that. Laws dealing with adultery, with lying, with stealing, the application of that. There were also ceremonial laws dealing with the priesthood and the tabernacle in the wilderness uh, that you've read about as you primarily go through the book of Leviticus. So you've got the Ten Commandments. You have um, civil laws and statutes that govern the Israelite community. And then you've got the ceremonial laws, three ideas there, that deal with the, the sacrifices and the priests and the, and the temple, uh, t tabernacle temple, and, and all of that. But then there is something that began to develop within Judaism subsequent to these years and primarily after the second or after the return of the Jews from Babylon and what is called the second temple period. The second temple period. And we'll put that on the, on the board here. The second temple period applies to the um, uh, Jews rebuilding the temple after Ezra and Nehemiah period, during that period, leading up to the, the New Testament era. That's the second temple. Within Judaism, and you should understand that Judaism, you, you hear this term today as a world faith. Judaism, uh, Islam is a world faith. Christianity is a world faith. Uh, plus the uh, various Eastern religions as well. But typically, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are kind of lumped together as three great um, uh, monotheistic uh, faiths. And I don't, we don't, we're not going to parse the word monotheistic. But when they, today when we use the term Judaism, you must understand something. While that reflects and describes this whole body of Jewish community, culture, synagogues, um, uh, teachings and practices and customs that have developed over hundreds and hundreds of years and that come down to today, that is not what you read in the law, the five books of Moses. Judaism is, a, is something that has largely developed separate from that, or within it. I mean, they, they keep the law, they study Torah. Uh, I'm not saying they do away with that. But Judaism has piled on many uh, teachings and, and oral law that become the, uh, take on the level of the actual law of God. I'll read, read you a quote about that. 
um, that has come down to us today. So Judaism is not necessarily the pure way of life that God revealed through Moses and established uh, under Joshua and the elders that inhabited the, uh, took over the land and the, let's say, the administration that was set up in that first wave after the conquest. Because as you know in your study of the, the Old Testament, uh, rebellion took place, sin came in, judges, um, you know, problems that led all the way up to some of the worst, which would be child sacrifice. Uh, uh, and introduction of, introduction of pagan practices in the temple for which both Israel and Judah went into captivity. When they came back in that period of the second temple then, the Jews never wanted that to happen again. And so this, within Judaism developed these systems and these teachings that, have been, that were codified. Uh, the, they were commentaries on the work of Moses upon the, the five books of the Torah and commentaries upon the commentaries, and rulings by the elders upon the rulings of a previous generation of elders, and rabbinical teachings and ideas that were elevated over a period of time in tradition to the level of a oral law. And this is what you. This is this is what what happened. Um, you, you've got the 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 uh, tradition. The the five books of Moses. Okay. There's the, the five books of Moses. I left my arm here. I'm working on my arm. It's getting better. But And what are the five books of Moses? Right. Okay, you, you got them there. That was what was given at, at, at Sinai. Secondly, there began to develop this, this oral law or traditions of the elders within the second temple period um, that, that came out. And then um, there's a, a, another less tangible element to this, which is um, kind of a spiritual development on, based on the, the written and the oral law that were uh, brought into kind of unified forms and interpreted and reinterpreted to meet the, the needs of changing conditions. So there was kind of a, just an ongoing development of this that leads to, to Judaism, but you know, spiritual application uh, within the Jewish community that um, adapted to the needs of Judaism, whether it was the Greeks as their overlords or the Romans or even in their own, their own way. So that by the time we come to the New Testament period, there has been built up on top of the five books of Moses, layer upon layer of oral law, traditional interpretation, adaptation through the generations that have taken, uh, the, these have taken on the status of what God gave to, through Moses, and Moses wrote into a book. And so, these are well understood, well documented within the, the Jewish uh, community. There's a book called, um, um, on, it, actually it's a commentary, it's an, an edition of the Mishnah, which is a compilation of all of these. Uh, when you hear that term Mishnah, that is a Jewish record of all of these oral traditions and adaptations through the generations that um, has uh, high status within the, the Jewish community. And I'm reading a quote here from a, um, a scholar named Herbert Danby, who wrote in an introduction to the Mishnah, making certain claims. And here's a quote. The Mishnah's own account of the origin and history of the oral law is given in a particular uh, reading. And it says, at the same time that the written law was given from Sinai, the oral law too was delivered to Moses. So he's saying that at the same time God gave the, the written law to Moses, well, the oral law was implied, or it was there. It was kind of hidden behind all of that. This is how the Jews interpret that. Um, and was delivered and handed down in turn to elders of successive generations. The Mishnah, this Jewish record, maintains that the authority of those rules, customs, and interpretations 
which had accumulated around the Jewish system of life and religion was equal to the authority of the written law itself, even though they found no place in the written law. It's a surprising admission by a Jewish scholar in an introduction to the Mishnah, this whole book that represents and codifies Judaism. They're saying that this oral law was kind of there when God gave it to Moses, gave the, the written law to Moses, and what has been accumulated ever since has the same weight as what you and I would read from the, uh, the, uh, the, the Word of God on, on the law. And so, when you understand this, this helps to understand then what Peter is talking about here in Acts, where he describes a yoke which neither our fathers nor you, we were able to bear. This oral law was written to solidify, um, beginning to solidify at the time of Jesus within the, Ju the, the uh, Jewish community, among the Pharisees especially. Um, and they were making claims that their teaching originated with Moses, which then brought them into a clash with Jesus, who was the one who gave the word to Moses. And that helps you to understand the background to that, to that clash. And so for the Pharisees, Moses' written law and the oral law and the traditions were all fused into one and in, with uh, their administration under their particular authority. Jesus rejected that and His clashes with, with them. Turn over to Matthew chapter 23, and you'll, you'll read the, the classic episode where Jesus just tore them apart, root from branch, Matthew 23, and what He said, we won't read the whole chapter, but look at what He said here. He, he rejected all of this ostentatious show that had uh, you know, grown out of some legitimate points within the law, but had taken on enormous, gigantic proportions, tassels, phylacteries, um, um, many other you know, garments and, and the, these things, um, pretentious show of long prayers, and um, so many different things that had developed. Look at um, what he said. Um, he said that in verse um, 1, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and His disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, this is a position of authority within Judaism, within the synagogues. You can, they, they, they actually unearthed within some of the, uh, ar the, the archaeological sites of where they've un uncovered Jewish synagogues, uh, a seat where the uh, the leader sat, and that represented the seat of Moses. It was a seat of authority, kind of like a, you know, kind of a somewhat of a throne within a Jewish synagogue where the, the authority sat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, observe and uh, observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say and do not. Verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on them, their shoulder, men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. These heavy burdens. This is what Peter's talking about. The heavy burdens of Acts 15, uh, verse 10. A yoke that our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Christ said to them, why do you bind a heavy burden? He might as well have said, why do you bind this yoke upon the people? Things that are uh, onerous and are beyond the intent of the law and the, the reason they were given and lay them on their shoulders. So that gets you the idea of this yoke that he's talking about. For all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments, speaking of the enlarged tassels and, and um, uh, dress that were to symbolize some aspect of their righteousness before the people, to be seen of men. Um, they love the best places at the feast and the best seats in the, in the synagogue. Uh, verse 14 uh, woe to you, scribes and hip hypocrites! You devour widows' houses for a pretense. You make long prayers. All right, be careful how long your prayer is when you're asked to give an opening or closing prayer and for lunch or for um, services. Um, therefore, you will re receive greater condemnation. And he just goes on, woe after, after woe, uh, through this chapter here, 
um, talking about ceremonial matters, uh, uh, that uh, gifts at the altar, the obsession with the minutia of tithing. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter here, um, but he rejected that. And he said, You're, you've created a system that people cannot uh, bear, and it gets away from the spirit of the law and what it is supposed to produce upon the heart. Uh, we won't, I won't turn there, but in Mark uh, chapter 7, he rejected the Pharisaic teaching about Corbin, showing that, uh, that it violated the spirit of the written law in, in regard to um, the, the uh, offerings and tithings and how that was used. And so he, Christ describes this misapplication of the oral law then as heavy burdens, hard to bear, and it's very similar to what Peter uh, says in Acts 15.10. The yoke that Peter's referring to was the misapplication of the law, fusing burdensome oral regulations with the law of Moses, and claiming the same authority for both. Claiming the same authority for both. And this is what, what uh, is being talked about here, and it, it violated the spirit and the intent of it even being given back under the Old Covenant during the time of Moses. Why? You, we could talk about a lot of that after the Jews came back from Babylon in the Second Temple period. They never wanted to go through that again. And so in their teaching, they erected further teachings, uh, as it were, kind of, if the law was right in the center, okay, then, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Then they created a system of teaching and commentary around that, that in time took on the same weight as that. But it was in, the, the intent, you could say, was good. It was to keep people from killing or lying. But then these traditions and these interpretations just multiplied through the generations and until you had this system that in, the, in, in time just uh, obscured the law. And particularly when it comes to the new covenant, and, and Jesus began to rip all these away with his Sermon on the Mount, where he began to show the spiritual intent of the law. I haven't come to destroy the law, he said. I've come to expand it, and he did it in a spiritual way. And so the law of Moses, that is that, that question here, is not the Ten Commandments. It is these so many of these other matters that have been put on by the Jews, as well as various matters like circumcision of the flesh. That was a part of that old covenant. And now how do we apply that to a Gentile community coming into the church? Which was the question. And so the church had to wind its way through this. And with, with the leadership of God's Spirit, with, with Christ guiding the, the church, to come to an understanding of how to deal with this. Um, and how to, to apply it. Uh, when, when you understand why this, the commandments, the, 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 the pure ten, if you will, by uh, my term, um, their, their importance and what they would have done for Israel had they kept them, they would have had a whole different outcome for the story of Israel. But we know that they didn't. But nonetheless, what God gave them through Moses in that, and then a civil administrative law on top of it that was built upon each of those commandments that was meant to regulate out of love relationships within the community, that was not burdensome. That was something they could indeed bear up under had they chosen to do that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's look at uh, kind of a consummate idea that Moses left Israel with before they went over, before he went up on Mount Nebo and died, and they went over into the land under Joshua. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, beautiful passage, we, we, we all know this, and, but it speaks about the, the, the law of God, the pure intent of the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 11. Moses says this, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. What's mysterious about not lying? What's mysterious about worshiping only one true God? There's no mystery to that. There's no mystery of uh, not of committing adultery. You don't commit adultery. You don't commit fornication. You keep yourself sexually pure, morally. Then there's going to be blessings 
a, and an ordered society, families are going to prosper. Generations are going to build, grow, develop, work together and produce good without problems that can be introduced generationally when, adult, let's say, adultery takes place. We'll need to go into all of that. That's the stuff of literature and media and, and, and the whole history. There's nothing mysterious about keeping God's law, and it's not far off. It's very easy to understand. Verse 12, it is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may bear it and do it. In other words, it's not something God has reserved up there and He, he hasn't shared it. He put it on the, tin, on the tablets of stone. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. It was right there in the land, in Israel. Um, it was in the community and it was to be taught by the, the, the teachers. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, and look at that next phrase, in your heart. We get back to the heart. Even in the, the Old Covenant, it's a, there's an there's a element of the heart. God purifying our heart by obedience, by if we, really the grace of the law of God. There is grace in God's law uh, because it, it, it represents the kindness of God, the love of God to mankind. And so he says, it is in, and in your heart and you may do it. The intent under Moses was that the law would produce good, and it would be in the heart. And so it was not too hard for the Israelites, they just made it hard because of sin. And that's what's happened today. Mankind makes the law of God hard because of sin. Well, we can't keep the Sabbath because I've got to work, and the whole structure of society is built around that. That's what makes it hard. And, you know, being faithful to one person for decades in, in my life and not being profligate sexually and experimenting and living my life the way that I want, that, you know, that, that crimps my style. And so I don't want to do that. I mean, I want to be a free, free bird, a free spirit, of, you know, self-expression and all that goes along with that. No, no, that, that, that creates complications. That creates problems. Stealing, that creates the IRS, Internal Revenue Service. Think that one through for a minute. And the need for lawyers. <laughs> so so um, God's law simplifies things. What had changed from the time of Moses? Well, it was the appending of all this oral traditional law. Uh, you know, and all these interpretations based upon the needs of a particular time and place. And human reasoning that got codified into Judaism, administered by uh, Pharisees and a Sanhedrin. And that's what that Peter is talking about. And so it's, it's a matter of really not very complicated to really know then what is being said. So with that, let's go back into the Acts text in, in uh, chapter 15. And I've, I've mentioned uh, they kept silent after um, Peter. They listened to Barnabas and Saul declare the fruits of their ministry. Then in verse 13, after they had become silent, James answered them. Now James, this is the James who's the brother of the Lord, brother of Jesus. This is not the James who is the brother of John. Why? He's already been killed by Herod back in, in chapter, um, was it chapter 12. So this is James, the brother of the Lord. He is the presiding, if you will, uh, minister, the lead minister, it seems, in uh, Jerusalem. We know from uh, Josephus' accounts, and there's some extra biblical accounts about James, he was highly revered, highly respected. Uh, he comes later. He wasn't among the 12 apostles, so he comes later. But he is um, highly respected, and he seems to be presiding over this council of, of the ministry and so he answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. So he's, he's giving a summary of, of this, and um, he's taken it all in. There probably have been meetings and discussions leading up to this day on the, this particular meetings, 
and everybody's read their position papers and, and thought it through. Uh, they've talked to Barnabas and, and Paul. They've heard Peter. They've heard the, um, the uh, other sides. He says in verse 14, Simon, or Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for His name. Uh, so remember, the name of God was on Israel, one who was a prevailer with God. Uh, that they covenant, God had covenanted with Israel. They were a special people. Now, these uh, leaders in the church, Jews themselves, were seeing very clearly that God is taking out a people from among the nations, all the nations. And with, these, with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, verse 16. Here is a quote from Amos chapter 9. After this... I will return, and we re will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. The house of David, the dynasty, the, the dynasty if you will, or the, the whole kingship that David had. He said, I will return. That's quoting Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. And I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. This is the quote. It's a bombshell. Look at that. The rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles called by my name. And he's quoting out of Amos, an Old Testament prophet, but a, a significant one uh, as to what was happening here. Now, the door of salvation is open to the Gentiles. Paul is going out to them, and there will be other uh, embassies to the Gentiles. We'll read about them uh, here as we get in, into the next chapter, and much that we don't have recorded in, in, in Acts. But the door was open to, uh, to the, these nations. God's making a people out of, out of them. James is tying it back to a, a prophecy from Amos that connects to the, the house of David that will be rebuilt. Now, the Word of God has gone to the Gentiles, but has the house of David been rebuilt? I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up. Has that been done? Not in its completeness, not in its totality. One reason is because in Luke 1, when the angel spoke to um, Mary about um, the child of Jesus that was in her womb, he will set, it says, upon the throne of his father, David. Christ will do that when He returns. Ezekiel 37 tells us that there will be a reuniting of the houses of Israel, and David will be their king. That's in the future. That is in the millennium. That hasn't happened yet. And again, understand this in the connection with the whole to the understanding of the, prophet, the promises to Abraham, because that's at the heart of what is being talked about here. The spiritual promises of Abraham to Abraham through Christ now are open to all peoples, to all nations. But have all nations in themselves come to Christ? Have they heard and repented? No. I, don't need, I should not need at this time to go into all the whys and results of that, despite 2,000 years of a false Christianity. And even that has had its failures as well as you know, certain successes in terms of what they've done. But looking at all of that, um, the, you know, it, it's, it doesn't represent the, the, the work of, of, of God and, and, and the aspect of truth. There's much yet to be done that we understand will begin to fall into place with the second coming of Christ, and including the fullness of the promises to all the, the spiritual promises to all, uh, all peoples that will begin as people come up to learn of the God of Jacob to in Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2, which this verse doesn't quote, but it, it speaks to that. When they go up to um, Jerusalem, they're going to go where David is, and the situation that is beginning to go out from there. 
These two verses we could unpack and talk a lot about, but that's just kind of a summation of it. But it's a bombshell to this audience that James is talking to, that Gentiles called by God's name or is true, that all can share in the grace of God. And uh, so in verse 18, he says, Known to God from eternity are all His works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so uh, the, the works of God are, are, are known from eternity. Um, he's quoting here from Isaiah uh, 45 and verse 21. God's purpose and God's plan uh, have been known to Him from eternity. He's no, he, no, that, this goes back even to the first few verses of Ephesians 1 with what God has purposed, the Father has purposed to do in Christ God and the Word knew what they were going to do. Uh, they, they both existed in eternity, and the purpose was laid down. That has been known. And so now with that as a background, James is going to then make his judgment, because in verse 19 he says, therefore. And coming to that, to that judgment, he is going to mention several things here that uh, they, that are, are details that have to be uh, communicated to the, to the Gentiles and sent out to them so that they know how to conduct themselves. And I think that's best left into a, a, the next class so we'll have the time to develop that and to, to go into it uh, because they're going to write a letter, uh, and I, I like to call it a doctrinal paper, to explain the, the results of their deliberations, and that's going to go out to these Gentile congregations and be carried out by uh, Paul and the others. So we'll, let's just cap it right there, and um, we'll, we'll pick it up with, um, with what he says there in verse 20, uh, with the, uh, four things that are going to be uh, enumerated. We'll talk about why that is important in the next class period. So we'll pick that up um, in the next session.